The escape rocket that Faget developed for Mercury was actually a pretty standard feature uh, for both the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, it was used on the American Apollo spacecraft, and it was used on the um, Soviet and Russian Soyuz capsules, which have been in use since 1967. And in October of 1983, two Soviet cosmonauts actually used the escape tower to uh, get away from an exploding booster uh, that was just about to lift off and send them up to an orbiting space station. Uh, the escape rocket fired and uh, pulled them away from, from the booster and saved their lives. Uh, some years after that, they did come to Houston and were introduced to Faget, who was understandably uh, very proud of the fact that he had um, developed that escape rocket and uh, very uh, pleased to hear that it had worked so well to save the lives of those uh, cosmonauts. Well, here you have a view that shows just how cramped the Mercury spacecraft is inside. Um, this is John Glenn in the Mercury simulator. It was actually taken with a fisheye lens that makes uh, things look even a little roomier than they actually are. You can see Glenn is in his form-fitting couch, and he's right in front of this instrument panel that's in front of him, and on all sides of him are various gear and components and switches and so forth. And uh, so, you know, you had to get in and out through this rather small uh, access hatch on the side and kind of, uh, you know, squeeze your way in. And, you know, Wally Shira said at one point, you don't get into Mercury, you put it on. Well, before they were going to send anybody, any astronaut up in Mercury, they decided they would test uh, the spacecraft and the boosters involved with uh, monkeys, with chimpanzees. And uh, this is a picture of uh, Ham, uh, um, a chimp from Cameroon, Africa, who was launched aboard a Redstone rocket on January 31st, 1961, on a suborbital flight. Now, the redstone uh, combination, mercury-redstone, would be used for the first few uh, mercury flights so that uh, astronauts would ride this redstone, which was a smaller and less powerful rocket than the Atlas, but would still propel them into space just on a kind of ballistic arc where they would go up and down, uh, reaching an altitude of uh, over 100 miles above the Earth and then come back down re-enter the atmosphere and splash down. These suborbital flights were uh, the um, build-up, the early Mercury test flights that were conceived as a preparation before anybody was actually sent into orbit. Now on Ham's uh, flight, he experienced more g-forces than uh, they had expected. His, uh, his uh, angle into the atmosphere was steeper than they had planned, and so he pulled uh, more G's than they were planning for the astronaut. And so um, his flight, which took place, as I say, in January of 61, was at a time when astronauts were waiting for their turn to become the first human in space. And um, those astronauts had already been chosen. In particular, Alan Shepard had been chosen to be the first Mercury astronaut to fly. And his... Uh, uh, colleague uh, Gus Grissom would be the second uh, suborbital flight. On the right side of the screen, you can see uh, Shepard on the right, Grissom in the center, and John Glenn on the left, who would be a uh, backup for both Grissom and Shepard on those suborbital missions. And on the left, you see Smile and Al Shepard, uh, photographed by a Life magazine photographer, clearly delighted at the fact that he would make the first Mercury flight. But um, even though he was ready to fly in the early months of 1961, they delayed his mission uh, to have another uh, unmanned test flight um, to correct the problems that had cropped up during Ham's Redstone flight. So Shepard uh, had his flight postponed, and in the meantime, Yuri Gagarin, a 27-year-old uh, Soviet Air Force major, was uh, sent into orbit uh, atop uh, Sergei Korolev's R-7 booster in a spacecraft called Vostok, and he made one orbit of the Earth 
on April 12, 1961. He was the first man in space. Um, and uh, you see on the bottom right, uh, still from actual television transmission of Gagarin inside Vostok 1. Vostok is a word in Russian that means east. And so um, Gagarin uh, made that one orbit of the Earth in 108 minutes, at which point he, uh, he was um, landed in Kazakhstan and, um, and came down safely and was greeted with a hero's welcome. This is a um, diagram of the Vostok spacecraft on the right, and uh, you can see that there is a, a spherical crew cabin, unlike Faget, uh, Karolyov decided to go with a sphere, which would also uh, produce the blunt effect on re-entry that created the uh, thick shock wave to uh, protect the spacecraft against much of the re-entry heating. Also, uh, Karolyov felt that uh, the spherical shape was very forgiving in terms of what uh, orientation it came in at into the atmosphere. Now, that was a heavier vehicle. Uh, than Mercury. In fact, um, uh, Vostok weighed with its retro rocket section, uh, you see the conical section down there where the retro rocket was, altogether it weighed about 10,000 pounds, whereas Mercury weighed about 4,200 pounds at launch, about 1,200 of that was the escape tower, and when you jettison the escape tower and the space Mercury spacecraft by the time it reached orbit, was about 3,000 pounds, so um, less than a third of the weight of Vostok. Now that was because the Atlas missile, um, which had a liftoff thrust of 360,000 pounds, could not carry any more than that. Whereas Karolyov's R-7 booster had a liftoff thrust of 950,000 pounds, and so it could accommodate the much heavier 10,000 pound Vostok spacecraft. And you see on the left there the spacecraft being readied in the uh, in the factory. Notice that the crew module, that spherical uh, crew module, is coated with a white ablative material which, uh, similar to the mercury heat shield, will uh, burn off and uh, carry the heat, the residual heat away so that it doesn't reach the metallic uh, skin of the spacecraft.